This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. The preseason is over. Cut down day is past. It is finally time to lock in those final NFL futures, talk preseason takeaways, and get set for NFL week number one. To do that today, we're going to talk to Anthony DeBundo of The Ringer, pick his brain on preseason takeaways, talk some training camp, and take an initial look at week number one as well. This is Covering the Spread, a FanDuel Research podcast. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a managing editor at FanDuel Research, joined here as mentioned by Anthony DeBundo. You can check him out on X. At Anthony DeBundo. Check him out at The Ringer, The Ringer Gambling Show, talking some soccer, talking some NFL there. Anthony, busy time of year for you. How are you doing today? Yeah, it's, it's some of the best time of the year for me with uh, the U.S. Open, which I dabble in as a fan of tennis. And uh, the Premier League is back and in full swing. Third match week uh, coming up this weekend. And also the NFL starts in less than a week now. So very exciting to have all of this collide at the same time. Meanwhile, my fills are in like a playoff race. So yeah, okay. it's, it's a really exciting time of the year. And, uh, you know, August is like the worst sports month, I think, all year. <laughs> September, October are two of the best. And uh, you've got all that going on, but I also I wanted to ask you about your Kyle McCord thoughts. I got uh, I've got my Syracuse hat over here for you. So you know, didn't wear it, wear it for the show, but did bring the Syracuse hat. Where are we feeling about cues for this year? I mean, I sent out a text to a few friends and was like, "All right, what's the realistic expectation?" And people are saying yeah. eight, nine wins. I mean, it's been a long time since Syracuse had those kind of expectations. I hope people aren't disappointed. I'm excited for this uh, this new you know era of of Syracuse, but uh, it's certainly more buzz than there's been in my time there and and even before. So, uh, Kyle McCord, for yeah. us, hell of a get, right? Yeah, and I don't know if I he's mean, necessarily like the level of Ohio State. I think a lot of Ohio State fans were pretty done with him by the end of that season. But for for us, like for the Orange, it's pretty awesome. I mean, he's no Tommy DeVito, but who That's can true. be, you know, at this point. So it uh, should be a fun my, year. My senior to. year was was the uh, DeVito 1 in 10 year. So yeah. I've seen all phases of Tommy De- Tommy DeVito over the years. I, I'm pretty sure I was at, uh, so I lived in Syracuse for five years, and uh, I'm pretty sure I was at Fagan's, uh, like right by campus, watching Tommy DeVito launch a bomb one time. I don't recall what NC year that was. State. Yes, yes, yep. yes. Yep. 2019. Uh, yeah, that yeah. would have, that sounds about right because that or was 18. like the yeah. prime going to that area of Syracuse time for me. Um, they were good, good that time. year. Yeah, they were fun. It was fun. I think the first Syracuse game I went to is the Clemson game that they won, uh, mm-hmm. and then I was not as good of luck after that, unfortunately. So uh. I jettisoned myself for the betterment of the university to make sure I never return to curse them after that at any point all there right so for today we're going to pick anthony's brain on some nfl talks and futures take a look ahead of week one as well to get you set for the final stretch run of the nfl all season but first a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to the covering the spread podcast feed wherever you get your podcast tomorrow we're talking southern 500 at darlington best bets for it. that will be on the show tomorrow for Friday on Wednesday also had a show here up uh, breaking down college football week number one with Kent Padgett if you want some thoughts on week one across college football check that out in the covering the spread podcast feed the FanDuel YouTube page or over on FanDuel TV plus as well football is back and there's no better place to get in on the NFL action than FanDuel America's number one sports book because right now all customers can bet five dollars and get a three week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV then you'll be able to watch every NFL regular season Sunday afternoon out of market game. Plus with FanDuel, you don't even have to leave the app to access real-time stats and data to help you make even more winning bets. Download FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Must be 21 plus and present in select states or 18 plus and present in DC. Offer ends 9-22-24. After a three-week free trial, the full price of NFL Sunday ticket will be automatically charged seasonally. Cancel any time. No refunds. Terms, restrictions, and embargoes apply. YouTube TV base plan required to watch YouTube TV. Redemption requires a Google account or current form of payment. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG. Call 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut. Visit mdgamblinghelp.org in Maryland. Hope is here. Visit gamblinghelplinema.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts or call 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY in New York. 
Now, Anthony, as we do for every person who comes on the show for the first time, kind of want to get a, a vibe for your process when it comes to betting the NFL. So before you place a bet, what process do you go through to make sure that is, in fact, a profitable bet? Yeah, so uh, before the season, I kind of build out power ratings for the NFL now and uh, go position group by position group, basically. I mean, all, you know, on offense, it's quarterback, it's O-line, and it, I kind of just lump the skill positions into one. Uh, defense, you've got, you know, your your run defense, your pass rush, and then your secondary. Uh, so it kind of gives you like a general baseline, uh, you know, six metrics for offense and defense, and then the special teams, and then the coaching uh, element of it. Uh, and it all kind of factors into my initial ratings, uh, I kind of use that as my baseline, though, because I'm of the belief that you can't just use a power rating to solely beat the NFL. I think there has to be nuance and analysis. And so, you know, I think over the course of an NFL season, there are so many things that are signal and so many things that are noise. And we look at turnover margin. We look at third down success. We look at, uh, you know, these high leverage, high EPA plays that are outliers, whereas, you know, underlying success rate, how good are you on early downs and on offense and defense and whatnot. And, and I'm not the best when it comes to like schematics and that kind of thing. Yeah. So I, I don't pretend to know like what the the difference is going to make for the sure. defense if they switch from cover three to cover two more over the course of the season. But uh, I, I do think it's it's really important, especially in the NFL where the teams are tightly constricted. Right, this is not college where you have 40 point gaps between teams right. and you have you know, a couple of injuries and all of a sudden like walk-ons from Kennesaw state are playing, you know, et cetera. Uh, so in the NFL, it, it truly is such a defined market that the most important principle that I would tell anybody in sports betting, but especially when it comes to betting the NFL week in and week out is just buy low and sell high. Nobody is ever as good or as bad as they seem to think and, and what they are. Uh, and, and you'll, you'll notice a theme to that, uh, over the course of our discussion, kind of as we get into the season long player markets and future markets, uh, where I'm like, you know, everybody's kind of picking and choosing what they want to remember about certain teams from last year and crafting their narratives around it. And I'm here to say, hey, like, I just can't quite get there on this team or that team. Uh, and I am more excited about other teams than, than, than maybe the market is. Certainly. Now you mentioned EPA, you mentioned success rate and stuff like that. Do those numbers go into your power rating model or is it strictly more of a subjective ranking on your end to try to grade out offensive line skill guys and stuff like that? Yeah. So preseason, uh, there's not a ton when it comes to uh, that because I, I just feel like using past data to color future projections can be a little bit tricky, but I mean, we're ultimately using past data to then subjectively analyze them. And that's more so where mine comes from. So it's like a, Hey, you know, like, uh, you know, Brock Purdy's a tough rank, but let's, let's say Dak Prescott, right? He has sure. he finishes second in EPA last year. I believe he was closer like six or seventh year before that. Like, where do you rate him? Uh, and I don't care about the playoffs uh, or your narratives or whatever. Like, where do you rank him in terms of like where he projects uh, to be efficiency wise, right? Because also, anytime you're using something like EPA, that ultimately does matter in terms of team context, right? Because nobody would say Brock Purdy's the best quarterback in the NFL, but if you right. just built your model around who had the best EPA per play last year, then you would have Brock Purdy number one. So uh, yeah, it, it's a combination of subjective and then using the data to kind of color those opinions. And then using underlying data to spot regression for teams too. You mentioned turnover luck and stuff like that. Close so game luck. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Now you mentioned signal versus noise and that's so relevant when talking about preseason takeaways, training camp takeaways. My favorite. A lot of it is noise, almost all of it, but there can sometimes be actionable takeaways. So what players or teams have you bumped up or down based on what you've seen since training camp opened at the end of July? That's a good point. So I, I think uh, the games themselves don't really matter to me, right? Uh, because if you just go and if you try to read off of these practices, like every beat writer, uh, whether they are positive or curmudgeonly has a slant and how they cover the team. And look, I'm, I have a lot of friends who are beat writers of, of NFL teams and like they do awesome work in keeping us informed, but like their subjective analysis of how Jalen hurts looks at camp or how uh, Kenny Pickett performed last season in camp or how insert player X did right at against the, in the joint practice against the Bengals or whatever, th that stuff to me doesn't necessarily matter, but like injuries certainly do. Yeah. Right. And you look at Pittsburgh and the offensive line situation for them. Now it's getting really dire uh, to the point where if you just pulled up, Football analysis did this on Twitter. If you just pulled up like 
projected uh, pass block grades for the Steelers offensive line. They are 32nd based yeah. on last year's numbers and using like historical averages for rookies. Uh, that's a concern, right? Uh, we know the Browns all of a sudden have these offensive line concerns that popped up. Uh, and and we look at the Colts who lost one of their best pass rushers in Evacom for the season. They lose their slot guy in downs. He's going to miss some time. Uh, they lose Jelani Woods for the year. So now all of a sudden the Colts lose arguably their second or third best pass rusher, their third and fourth receiving options, maybe second and third receiving options, depending on what you think of A.D. Mitchell. So I think Jelani Woods should be their first receiving option. I have in too, ma- too many two tight end dynasty leagues. I And just another lost broke. year, it's a shame. Yeah, yeah, another one. Last year was tough, man. It was tough. It was. And so now you're like, okay, how do you how do you adjust the Colts downward? Because those were areas where I was pretty high on the Colts, uh, especially the pa- the defensive line pass rush and the and the skill group I thought was underrated. And uh, now I'm a little more bearish on the Colts, right? So I, they, I mean, they've been nudged downward, and the Steelers have probably actually taken the biggest hit for me uh, to the point where I'm probably going to bet some under at some point this week before the games kick off next week. Yeah, but like in terms uh, of raising ceilings, like I don't know, like Caleb Williams made some nice plays. We we kind of right. knew he could do that against the backups of the NFL because right. he did it in college at USC. So I need to see more. Exactly, and I think that's a level-headed way to look at it, where you're making more bumps down than bumps up based on yes. injuries. I think that's the right way to play things. Never want to get too high based on preseason because the hot seat can matter for coaches, how much they put into preseason stuff like that. So I think that that's a proper way to balance things. Kenny Pickett, 2023 uh, NFL preseason MVP, uh, yeah. and then was was benched midseason. So and uh, yeah. battling with Tanner McKee for a number two job. What could possibly yep. uh, go wrong with overrating Kenny Pickett based on that? Now, you mentioned bumping the Steelers down, potentially looking at some futures on them. Any team level of futures you think are worth targeting before we get things underway? So for what it's worth, I have not bet a single Super Bowl future. Uh, okay. I have not gotten to that point yet. Uh, usually I have one or two conference futures by this point. Uh, like last year, I was a big Lions guy. Had them had them twelve to one NFC. Still not sure how they lost that game to San Francisco, uh, and then had some Ravens AFC, and still not sure how they lost. So uh, just a heartbreaking conference championship Sunday for me. But uh, this year, I have not bet anybody, uh, and I think a lot of it is because uh, you're seeing helium for a lot of teams in the market that I'm just not nearly as enthralled by. And the two on the board that, that are shown right there, uh, I want to see. Can you try to guess which two teams I'm a little bit more skeptical on than the market here? Houston Texans and Philadelphia Eagles. You got two of the three, one of the two. Uh, okay. It is Houston and it is Detroit. Okay. And okay. I kind of think that we all watch them have these, these good playoff runs, so to speak, where Houston annihilates Cleveland and Detroit uh, gets two, you know, scrapes by uh, two teams that are pretty inferior in the Rams and the box. And then they, really should have beat the Niners. They took it to them in that game. And now everybody just kind of expects more progression. Everything's going to be linear. They improved their weaknesses. So now they don't have any and uh, their strengths are just going to continue to be their strengths. And uh, I know a lot of people are picking them to make the Super Bowl, and I get it. I see the case like CJ Stroud. The ceiling is there, but I'll ask the next question. Where do you think CJ Stroud ranked last season, week 10 to week 18 in EPA? Uh, out of 31 quarterbacks with at least 150 plays, where do you think he ranked? What week was the Jets game? Because that's the week where he got hurt. His EPA was like I think that was point, the second half. Yeah, it was so negative point two five per drop back. Um, yeah, in that game, it was it was really bad. Um, weeks 10 to 18, I am gonna guess that he ranked seventh in EPA per drop back. It's funny because I did a podcast with Austin Gale and he guessed eighth. The correct answer was 16th. Oh wow, okay. So, so I'm guessing the Jets I, game must have been in there then, because that game the Jets was game was in the not Tampa, great. Yes. Uh, and I, ha- I have to go back and look at what it wasn't without it, but even still, it's probably not going to be top 10. Right. And uh, that game still counts. I know that he didn't have, I think Nico Collins and tank Dell, he was down a couple Del, receivers, Del but was like done by then, I think it still counts. Like it, it still counts towards the record. You need to include all data when trying to judge this. Stuff. Exactly. Yeah. So anyway, that's kind of my point, right? And the lines, uh, you're hearing a lot about this indoor outdoor thing. Uh, Sure. You know, but it hurts their defense too. And their defense was a bottom five unit in the secondary last year. Uh, and I, th- they should be better in theory, right? They can't be worse, but there's no guarantee they're going to be better. Everybody can't be better. So I, I yeah. kind of push back against the Lions uh, hype and the, the Texans hype. And to be honest, even Baltimore, I think, you know, sure. the Chiefs have established themselves as this, this alpha team and they deserve to be top because they've just done it enough that I'm not willing to go against them anymore. And the Niners, I think still have the the ceiling, the only ceiling that can that can really match that chief ceiling. 
But I think when you start to look at, uh, and I, I find this interesting, like when teams do power ratings, when when you'll read power ratings from around the yeah. the league, who their number three is tells you a lot. And I think you're seeing a lot of Baltimore, a lot of Detroit, even Philly has some questions, and Houston. And for me, I'm just like, you know what? I'm going to skip that tier because that tier <laughs> is always the buzz teams from the year before yeah, who just hit their peaks and then people just expect them to stay there and they never do. Uh, not, 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 I shouldn't say never. 70% of the time they come back down and then there's another team from the, that third tier that makes the jump. And uh, I do have a team that I'm interested in in that tier. Okay, let's hear about that. Actually, let's talk about the Texans more first and then I'll ask you about that uh, that third tier team you like. I have the Texans ninth in my power rankings, which is very high, I think. Like it's it's below Whoa, the Super that's low. I, I thought it was high. So like when I was filling out my numbers, well, I thought it was high. Fanduel However, has them uh, sixth. There you go. Yeah. And like, I so like when I pull up the numbers, like I'm shocked to see that I'm low on the Texans because ninth to me feels high. The problem is they have a very difficult schedule. Uh, if you look at their expected win total based on my power rating for them, um, compared to their actual win total, they lose 0.6 wins based on their schedule. And the Jags actually gain 0.2. So like yep. the schedule differential between those two teams is 0.8 wins. So I adore CJ Stroud. I love him to death. I think the Jags are actually valued to win the AFC South because of the schedule discrepancies, because of the fact that the Jags are just completely disregarded. Like as much as I love CJ Stroud, I still like Trevor Lawrence too. I know it's been rough at times, but he was seventh in MVP voting back in uh, 2022 without Calvin Ridley and stuff like that. So I agree with you on being lower than market on the Texans. I can't, I'm not going to try to talk you into joining me on the Jags train, but I think we're on the same page where we've gotten a bit ahead of ourselves with the Texans steam and where they're at right now. Yeah, I agree. Uh, now I also bet the Jags to win the South and pick them. Oh baby. Uh, so I'll, I'll be two for two there. Uh, the Colts are my team, full disclosure. Uh, yeah. I'm a Colts fan. Uh, rooting for Richardson really hard. think yeah. it's going to be a little bit too much of a roller coaster to like trust them to win the division. Uh, I think they're going to be really fun to watch. I think they're going to be really efficient in the red zone. I think they're going to have major problems on the secondary, though, uh, because they played a lot of backup quarterbacks. They played a lot of yeah. mediocre quarterbacks last year. The schedule's a little tougher. Not overall, but in terms of like – opposing quarterbacks uh, that they face. And I think they're going to get diced up a little more. And uh, I'm excited because it's going to force Richardson to play from behind. And the one time he had to do it last year right, was that Rams game. And he looked, that was right. his best game. Yeah. So I think there, there's some fun for the Colts, but I, at that price, I'm not there. Um, I am there on the Jags. And I think it's yeah. so funny how narratives change because I just wrote a piece for the ringer. Worst of first rankings. Uh, kind of the eight teams. Everybody talks about this. This nineteen out of the last twenty-one years, at least one team in the NFL yeah. has gone from worst to first. Three years ago, the Jags were the worst team in the NFL. The Urban Meyer debacle. Uh, the next year, they won the division. And you can draw so many parallels between the Jags of last year and the Texans of right now. It's not. I mean, everybody loved the coach, Doug Peterson, D'Amico Ryan's. Everybody loves the quarterback. They're on the rise. They signed a couple of veteran receivers, Calvin Ridley and Stefan Diggs, and uh, people just kind of gloss over the thing and expect them to take a big step forward. And, I mean, Jacksonville was fine last year. They were right around 12th best team in the NFL. They ran bad at the end of the year. They collapsed, lost to Tennessee in Week 18, and missed the playoffs. If they had won that game, they win the division. Maybe they beat Cleveland in, in the playoff game. Houston probably loses the first road game in Buffalo or, or Kansas City. And all of a sudden, we're having such a different conversation about these two teams. So I agree. I, I think Jacksonville's value on the division, I think they're going to win nine, ten games. I think Houston's also going to win nine-ish games. And I think they're going to be right next to each other. And so at plus 270, I think it's worth a shot uh, on Jacksonville. So I'm in agreement with you there. Um, I just looked. I have Houston 11th. Okay. So we're pretty much 14th. Aligned. 14th defense. And uh, 10th offense. Yeah. So we're on the same page where they're in the same tier. That's kind of a glob tier to me is like a lot. There's yeah. not a lot of separation between those teams. So sounds like we're pretty aligned there. Um, and I find that reassuring because I'm, I bet Tex the Texans a lot last year had their divisional futures from like, yep. I think week 11 or so. So I was very grateful the Jags lost that game. Um, it's, I, I, it's it so feels funny. bad to turn I, on yeah. them this year. 
I ended up with a future on every team except the Jags in the AFC South at <laughs> various points of last season. So that loss that they had to the Titans like was huge. Um, right. so I had Tennessee preseason. I added some Colts midseason, and then yeah. I I had Houston somewhere around week eight or ten um, or so. But yeah, it's so funny because uh, I was so anti Jacksonville right last year, and now I'm in again uh, I- on the on the Jags. It's all very about the much price. the same. The Jags, like you said, were the Texans of 2022, a team you could keep on betting. They were continual undervalued in the betting market. Lines were the same that year too. And uh, this year, it seems like we're back on the Jags once again. Now, yeah, you the Jags, the Jags were yeah. minus 160 to win this division last year. That's bananas. That's in, I I understand it, but bananas. Yeah. Now you mentioned there is a third tier team you're eyeing for this year. Which team is that, and uh, which market do you want to bet them in? So they are getting buzz. So I, I can't just be like, oh, it's the team nobody's talking about. Uh, but I love the Green Bay Packers. Uh, I've got my cheese head somewhere around my office. I have to go <laughs> pull it out. Um, but I, I think that you know, two to one or better to win this division is is good for me. They have the easier schedule in Detroit, right? They benefit from that, uh, and I just love the ceiling of this offense because going into the season, do I have them as a top five, six unit? No. I have them closer to closer to 10th, 9th. But uh, it would not take much for me to then immediately hey say, hey, this is like a top three or four offense. Because in the second half of last year, where do you think Jordan Love ranked out of 31 quarterbacks in EPA per play? CPOE. Uh, third minimum. Third. Yeah. Third, okay. So think about that, right? I mean, yeah. compare the buzz for one guy versus the other, and we say, oh, well, we've only seen half of a season of Jordan Love. Can we trust it? And that's a reasonable thing to say. I think it's fair to say, like, oh, I don't know if I trust it. But he was better than C.J. Stroud down the stretch if you just go by EPA. You could throw team context in there, sure. sure. But just look at the fantasy stuff. And this is something that uh, Craig Hurlbeck or one of the Ringer Fantasy Football guys mentioned. I think it was Craig. Houston has three receivers getting drafted really early in fantasy. Diggs, Collins, Dell. Green Bay has no one going early. All four of their guys might be number ones, might be the fourth. I don't even know. I, I couldn't tell you. I think Wicks, Dontavian Wicks is kind of the analytics darling where they love how much he gets separation. Christian Watson has been the most established guy, but then Dobbs is the one with the connection with love. So I think Green Bay has so many different ways to have upside. And I think Matt LaFleur is really underrated as a coach. And I think their defense, which stunk last year and was so passive and has so much talent, gets a, a, a jolt of fresh life. And and again, no guarantee it's better, but I think the upside for Green Bay is really high. And the upside so is- I, I did bet them to win the division. Yeah. Uh, and if I bet a Super Bowl, what is their what is their odds right now at FanDuel? You want to pull it up for I the Super Bowl? I think that they were 18. That might be way off. Let me pull it up here. 18 might be a bet for me. And right now they are 18. on the 18, board. yeah. Hmm. Not bad. It seems it seems uh, like they're they're grouped with Miami and Atlanta, and I guess not. Really I would Atlanta, much rather have them. Than I would much rather have them. Teams. Who's next on the list? The Jets. No, thank yeah, you. Yeah, the Jets are at eighteen. I've taken their Dallas. Under. No, I, thank you. Uh, I have. The I would probably not higher. take them over Buffalo. Yeah, but uh, although yeah, the AFC versus the NFC piece is a big difference. Yeah, it definitely is. Uh, and with the the Packers, it's young guys who gelled during the year, which is why I'm willing to put stock into that second half run that Jordan Love had. And like even the full season numbers for their passing offense were really good. Um, 0.202 net expected points per dropback is a really good number after adjusting for schedule. Like that's that's a really good number. So even if you just take the full season, it's not just a half season. The full season data for Love was still very good too. So I'm on board with you where I think they're a value two to one to win the NFC North. Now, Anthony, we are exactly one week away from week one. So let's take a look at the week one odds over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Any value stand out to you on first look for those week one games? I'll tell you what, that Eagles line is touching three almost. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to wait a little because we've taken a lot of Eagles money and it has not gotten bought back, even as limits have gone up. So uh, I think if that gets to three, you can even probably find a juice three now. That's going to be a wager for me in week one. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I like that. Thought I had to sneeze there. Um, so, <laughs> <All good. laughs> uh, as you scroll down the board, uh, there's a few that that kind of stick out to me. The first one, that Titans total has gotten hammered up. Uh, that was sitting at 42 and a half, 43. It got as high as 45. Uh, I think that if that gets above 45 again, that's going to be an under for me. I still have major questions about Caleb Williams' sack rates. I think that that could become a problem because he holds the ball for so long, and Tennessee's pass rush is pretty good. Uh, and then on the other side, 
it depends on what you make of the Bears defense because the Bears defense was a legitimate top 10 unit, borderline top five if you if you count all the turnovers they also forced in the second half. I like Eberflus as a defensive coordinator type, um, and I do think Levis is going to have major sack problems. I think that Tennessee went out and spent a lot of money this offseason to try to raise their floor. I don't know if I like the offensive moves at all. Like We talked about Ridley and uh, the running back situation. The O-line is still pretty bad. Uh, but the defense, I think, will be better. Uh, they improved the secondary to the point where it will no longer be one of the biggest sieves in the NFL. So uh, I do think that total is nearing a little bit too high. I did take some Jets. Now, the Jets have been bet- getting bet down pretty heavy on that Monday night yeah. game. I mean, if you're going to be against San Francisco, I think this is the best matchup to do it uh, because they have the the secondary to kind of hold against the uh, against the Niners' talent. And they have the pass rush to take advantage of an O-line where Trent Williams is not playing football and the rest of the O-line has looked as bad as it's ever looked. They are an old, aging roster. Uh, I do like the Jets, especially in week one, where I know they're healthy. I don't know that's going to be true with the right. turf and all the disaster. Um, so I, I'd want four on the Jets because I have it a smidge under four. Uh, but I do like the Jets plus four in week one. And then Dallas-Cleveland under. Is that still at 43? They can bet down again. 42 and a half now. 42 and a half now, yeah. So uh, I would like 43 uh, on that one. I, I just think the biggest signal for Dallas, and I'm, I've am i been known to be a bit of a DAC apologist over the years, but Same. the biggest thing for Dallas is the home away stuff and the yeah. true for Cleveland. And this is like the biggest home away split team, two teams in the whole league. Uh, and Dallas has these inconsistent offensive line questions, although I think they'll be better than people think. Cleveland has uh, just an offensive line debacle, and I don't really trust Deshaun Watson to do much. Uh, and you throw in Dallas as a way splits, Dallas on the grass, where they don't get the cadence and the timing and the the here we go, you know, it doesn't work quite yeah. as well away from home. So uh, I do like the under there in that game. I think it'll be an ugly kind of grinder. Uh, yeah. And I do think <laughs> Dallas is a fascinating team in terms of like the season long market because. The, they have been so aggressively bet against. And outside of like Deron Bland, what's actually happened this offseason that is so bad for Dallas? They got younger at left tackle. <laughs> they might have yeah, better health at left worse, tackle this year. But, you know, I, yeah. I think the like Tyron Smith missed so, so much time last year. Like it's hard for me to view that as being a downgrade because he looked good during the preseason too. So it's like, you know, is it like, I agree with you where I don't know it's that big of a downgrade. They got rid of Michael Gallup, but he was getting replaced by Jalen Tolbert at times last year. Anyway, he was cooked. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he retired. Like there's a reason that he retired. So yeah. like, I agree with you. I have that total of 41.4. So agree with you there. I actually have a bit more value on the bears versus Titans one. I have that at 42.9, I think. And that's at which, which is where now. it was like a week ago. Right. And you get a win on a key number of 44 under is minus 105. I think that there, there are a lot of reasons to be enticed by the, the under for that one for sure. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the one macro trend to look at is this field position stuff, right? Cause you're getting like an extra four or five yards in the preseason yeah. uh, and will teams, will teams have the good stuff. So quote unquote, right. the, the, the good trick plays, the good, well-designed stuff. Are they, are they saving it for the pre for the regular season? Um, that's an interesting macro question like that. So for example, uh, the Rams game is on Sunday night. Uh, what's that number at right now? It's 51 still to go 51 the and a half. Rams are at 51 and a half. Yeah. So like they closed 53 in that playoff game. Got as right. high as 53. Uh, why is it a point and a half lower? If we think the scoring environment's better, it's a playoff game. It's not, it's a regular season game. So not right. as heightened as a playoff game. Uh, why is that total lower? Right. So that, that almost yeah. seems low to me. Um, but from a macro perspective, I uh, I do have a hesitation against unders, even though I already said I'm betting two of them. Um, just because I'm, I, I think that it's a fascinating trend to to watch, and I'll be, yeah. you know, we'll have the data. And again, it's like, what do you what do you learn from preseason? I don't know because right. teams might just boot it out of the back of the end zone again, right? Just to be safe. And I have a a bump in my model for that, but it was like, I think it was 0.25 points per game. And that may be way low. Like it's very possible. I am way could, too low. Could be in, one to two points. That yeah. up. Um, so it's something we'll have to, to pay close attention to during the year. So if I'm like talking about my, my personal process here, I just want a larger gap between my model and the market before I bet something, whereas right. typically I'd take it at, you know, X points. I want it to be X plus one or X plus of half a point. Um, in order to actually fire on something. So yeah, it's, it's something that I've, 
been worrying about for the past <laughs> six months at this point is how yeah. kickoffs will impact scoring. I was joking around. Uh, it, it will probably be plus EV to just take the money line dog in every NFC South divisional game this year. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm I'm not even. I'm only somewhat kidding. I mean, I think that that like that division, uh, all of those teams are so blah that like yeah any one game could go either way there was a ton of action i know in the carolina game that total got bet down i think a smidge yeah. you have anything else in week one um i had the packers money line you kind of alluded to that a bit um with the looking at the spread uh it's, it hasn't really moved to my favor because i took this in a while ago uh yeah. but plus 126 i think that's still pretty good value given this is a neutral site game so that's mm-hmm. the main one for me is packers money line plus 126 is the one that stands out most yeah, I mean, I have that game. It's pretty close to a coin flip. Uh, Eagles yeah, by I, one. Same here as well. Uh, and I don't have any faith in my Eagles rating. I think the Eagles are... Uh, <laughs> and Shio Kapati has said this on the Ringer Philly Special. Like, they are... If you had to pick the three highest variance teams, just because of how the highs we saw from Philly two years ago and then the lows of how bad right. it got last year, and we know that Sirianni and Hertz have this kind of disconnect. I live outside of Philadelphia, so I'm, I'm kind of very much immersed in, in the Philadelphia right. talking... Sca- uh, landscape uh, about the about the team and i am fascinated by you know it, was it hurts was it the coordinators was it the coach do they all hate each other is it going to blow up again um, negative point differential type stuff like it's all on the table for the eagles i have a dallas divisional future so fingers crossed that stuff i'm getting crops close up to it i, I <laughs> yeah nobody's won that do i feel good about it no but i did it <laughs> I, I get it I, yeah. I honestly like cannot believe how much the market has moved toward philly in the last three yeah. months that's Off of again, nothing. Right. Like, unless exactly. you think Jahan Dodson is like a game changer or that all of a sudden Dak forgot how to play football. Like they've been the best team in the NFL for the last three regular seasons in terms of just total wins. The the Cowboys. Yeah. Um and it's interesting. F- Philly has been on a steady decline really since that su- since like er- mid season twenty twenty two. Right. Uh, it could come back up, but I mean the market's already pricing them to just be right back. Like they're back. Like we talk about the the Cowboys losses, like Sam Alu's gone, Kelsey's gone. Like I know they have in house replacements who are very good, and we like think we they're very good. Of, we think yeah, exactly. We think we don't they're know. very good. You know? We have not seen it in action yet, so yeah. it's it's a different thing. And I think we've dinged the Cowboys more for that than the Eagles. All right, Anthony, no Super Bowl bets for you yet, but I just want to hear straight up, disregarding the odds, who is yeah. the Super Bowl matchup and pick for twenty twenty four. So we had to submit these for the ringer on Wednesday. So I, I actually okay. have submitted an official pick, and I guess I have to stand by it. Uh, okay. No team in NFL history has ever three-peated, but if you just take the odds away, I think Kansas City's going to be better this year offensively. Do. Can't be worse, right? Uh, Rasheed Rice doesn't seem like he's getting suspended now, so that's a big big part for the Chiefs. But I'm going to go Chiefs to win the AFC. Uh, I'll take them over the Bengals in the okay. uh, AFC championship game. I think Cincinnati bounces back. We didn't get to talk about that much, but – do like that new in the north. Uh, they're kind of in that next tier as well with uh, with Green Bay, where I'm like, oh, I'm kind of interested. And then in the NFC, sure, the Green Bay Packers Love to it. beat uh, the Dallas Cowboys. And then, uh, yeah, the Chiefs beat the Packers in the Super Bowl and uh, do it again. And kind of the ultimate parody sport becomes dominated by the same team for three years, which has never happened. So the I thing mean, about the Chiefs is they're dominant, but they're dominant in ways that are supremely entertaining to watch because exactly. every game comes down to the final two minutes when they play them. And if you offered me like, hey, right now I can give you a Mahomes versus Love Super Bowl matchup, I'm in. That sounds great. I'd, I'd have Absolutely. a blast watching that game. So if that is the matchup, I'll be very okay with that. All right, so Anthony's Super Bowl pick is the Chiefs over the Packers in Super Bowl LIX. That is all that we have here for today on Covering the Spread. Big thank you once again to Anthony DeBundo. Check him out on X at Anthony DeBundo. Find his work at The Ringer and on The Ringer Gambling Show as well, talking some soccer, talking some NFL. Anthony, I appreciate the time. It was a blast talking to you. Go Q's this year, and uh, hopefully we'll talk to you again soon. Absolutely. Go Orange and go Colts. Alrighty. Again, uh, thank you to Anthony. I am on X at Jim Saunas. You can find FanDuel Research on X at FanDuel Research. Back once again tomorrow talking Southern 500 NASCAR best bets for that in Darlington. We'll talk to all of you then. This has been Covering the Spread, a FanDuel Research podcast. 